Well, good morning. <laughs> I, um, this, this morning, if you're just joining with us, we're wrapping up a series, but that's okay, because if you missed any of them, we have them online, and, and we would love for you to, to catch up. We've been talking about love for the last uh, three weeks, and this is a great month to talk about it. Uh, we had Valentine's Day wedged in between there, hopefully had a great experience. Uh, but, but as we come to today, you know, we've looked at a few things uh, throughout the, the last couple of weeks. And the first one, we really defined what love is. That, that you have to really start with an accurate definition, because the reality is, oftentimes, if you just leave it up for everyone's definition, we would all say something differently. You know, we kicked off that series with listening to little kids define love, and uh, their, their uh, answers ranged across the board. Why? Because it was filtered through what they saw it as. You know, that, that if, whether it's, you know, you name it, you know, they just kind of had their love defined a little bit differently than what you and I would define it. And so we looked through Scripture and we saw how God defines love, how He is love, and that He loved us in this, that while we were yet sinners, He died for us, that there was this action, this decision that really took place, that God decided to love us even in a sinful state, and then that we have to make a decision personally to love him or not, and that no one can make that decision for us. You know, it's one of those things that, that everyone has to kind of do on their own. They have to make this personal decision. Are they going to love God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength, or are they not? And then last week, we, we looked at the, the reality that as you look in, in the scripture, love is truly pure. That there's a purity that comes when you're truly looking at the true definition of love. That this, this idea that as God loved us, it was this pure love. There, there wasn't anything expected. There wasn't any you know, conditions around it. That he offered an unconditional love. And that he calls us to, to love others in the same manner. And that when you've grown up in maybe a life that's been love is conditional... That I'll love you if, or I'll love you when, or I'll love you as long as. When we've grown up in that, it's sometimes hard to really understand an unconditional love of the Father. That, that even as we, we fall down, that, that as we ask forgiveness, He picks us up and He sets us back on course. That while we were yet sinners, that He would die for us when we were unworthy, when we were unjustified. And yet He calls us to love others in the same manner. This high calling. And we looked at what that looked like. That there's no way that we can accomplish that. I mean, when you look at loving unconditionally, I mean, who does that, right? And yet Christ calls us to this level of love. And the only way that we can do it is to truly know the one who's loved us. We realize that there's a difference between believing in God and knowing God. That there are many who would say that they believe in God. But the reality is that, that Jesus, as you see his life, as you see in the way in which he walked this earth, and, and the, the Apostle John said that, that we should walk in the way in which Jesus walked. And so we dove into that last week. And we said, how did Jesus walk, you know? I mean, what did that look like? How did that feel? I mean, how, how is it so distinguishable that it wasn't unlike anyone else? And we found that, that Jesus walked in relationship to the Father. That he walked with a transparency. That he walked with this idea that it's God's will, not his own. And that we're to call to be in the same type of relationship with our Heavenly Father. Not just to believe in him. It says even the demons believe and shudder. But to truly know God. Well, this week we wrap up. And, and I'm excited about this week because there's the reality that you know, sometimes we, we talk about a lot of things in church, right? I mean, you know, I grew up in church, and many of you grew up in church, and whether you didn't grow up in church, you know that we talk about a lot of things. And sometimes those things are very, very spiritual and very, very deep. Sometimes those things can, can be very philosophical, you know, philosophical? I don't even think that's a word. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes they, they can be all up here, kind of top shelf type of ideas. But some, you know, we have to have, realize that unless we bring them down to the bottom shelf, unless we, what some person says, put handles on the truth in which we learn and walk out of here with them, they, they really don't have a chance to really make a difference in our life. And that we can, we can learn a lot of things, but if we never apply those, then why have we learned them in the first place? Yeah, I remember being convicted one time. Someone said, Jonathan, your, your level of, of understanding is far greater than your level of obedience. I was like, oh, my lands, that's, you know, okay, tell me what it really is. You know, it's like, that, that nails the, 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 hits the nail on the head. The, this idea that, that I don't need to learn anymore right now. I know what I need to do. I just need to do that which I have learned. And oftentimes I could say that in my Christian walk, that's the case. It's not that there's more to know. No, 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 there's, there's a lot more to know. 
a lot more to learn. But the reality is, oftentimes, I haven't lived up to that which I've already learned. And so while I'm pleading for God to, God, just show me the way, show me the way. He's saying, Jonathan, would you just do what I've already asked you to do. Let's start there and then walk in that path. And so today we're going to really put some, some legs to this truth. So we're putting some handles on this idea of love. We're, we're hopefully walking out of here with an excitement to do that which God has commanded us to do and an idea of what that actually looks like. You know, Craig Groeschel said, if you don't know the purpose of something, all you can do is misuse it. That's a great quote. You know, in that room, when you look at love, I mean, how many times has love, that word love, been misused in our society? Maybe it's even been misused in your own life. And the reality was, it's probably because someone really didn't understand the true purpose of love. Why, why, why we have this word to begin with. They didn't understand definitely a love from the Father and this unconditional love. And so if you don't understand the purpose of something, all you can do is hope to misuse it, you know. Uh, any gym membership people here? Like, have you ever owned a gym membership? Uh, not that you ever went, but you paid somebody once a month, right? Like you, you gave them money whether you walked in the building or not. Great business plan. I love that business plan. So, but, but the reality is I, I've had gym memberships throughout my life. And I know, you know I'm intimidating, right? Um, but, but I've had gym memberships whether I went or whether I didn't go. And, and they always started out the same exact way. You, you walk in, someone meets you at the front desk. You say, I want a membership. They say, oh, okay, great. And they take you into a little room and you sit down and you fill out a whole bunch of paperwork. And they're basically, they're making sure you can pay uh, even if you don't show up. And uh, because they know you probably won't after three weeks, right? And so, so they're, you know, they're making you fill out all this paperwork. And then they say, we're going to give you a tour. And you're like, Phew. Okay, and so after one of these tours, you get very cocky because you act like I know the lay of the land. I know what to do with the machines. I, I know how to do this. And so, so once again, when we moved here, you know, kind of walked through this whole idea, walked through this routine, and I'm taking a tour of the facility and, and not paying attention, and they're kind of pointing out different machines. And, and then I find myself the next day walking in with no tour guide, right? I'm just kind of walking in. You're going to do what you're going to do. And so I, I remember, you know, you walk up to certain machines and, and sometimes you don't know what the machine does. Can we just be honest here? Like, you know, there's, there's a lot of contraptions, some cables, some weights in there, but you're really not sure how it works. And, and hopefully there's a picture on there of this little guy and it's like highlighting which area this, this works. And so you have some understanding, some basic understanding of how I can get in this machine and act like I know what I'm doing. But every once in a while, that little sticker is either faded or rubbed off, and then you have a choice to make. Either you pretend, and you sit down, and you act like you know what you're doing, or you move on to the next machine. I always like to pretend, all right? And so, so I remember the first time I did this, I saw the machine. I, I kind of had an idea of what it was because I saw this, like, you know, this guy that was much bigger than me in the picture, and he had these like, highlighted areas, and I'm like, okay, that's, that's the way you do that. And so I remember getting in, and I immediately knew as I started the machine, I have no clue what I'm doing. Like, I, this is not the way this machine works. If it is, someone's very sick. Like, they made a, you know, but, but this can't be the way this machine works. And so at that moment, then you have, you're faced with another decision. Either you act like, well, I know better than what the machine is supposed to, like, I have my unique workout, or you sheepishly get off with your head down, hope, not making eye contact with anyone, hoping no one saw you, and you move on to another machine. I always chose the latter, right? I just, I always like realized very quickly, I don't know what I'm doing. I didn't want to be on a YouTube video of someone filming me, not knowing how, how, you know, how to use the gym machine. And so I quickly move on. And I found that, that the best way to, to not get in those situations anymore was to listen when they were giving the instructions at the beginning. To listen and to really pay attention and not to act like I already knew. You know, sometimes my kids do this. I'll start to explain something to them. They're like, no, no, I know, I know, I know. I'm like, no, you don't know. <laughs> or you would have done it the right way, right? And you're like, don't tell me you know. You, you, your actions say you don't. And sometimes when we talk about love, we quickly go, oh, yeah, 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 I got it. Got it. Love God, love people. Got it. I don't think we do <laughs> all the time, right? I mean, if, if we had it nailed down that much, I think our lives would look differently. I, I think our churches would look differently. I, I think the way in which... Others view Christianity would look differently. But sometimes we nod our head, we act like we know, but, but, but the reality is, if we were to be honest, the sticker's gotten rubbed off and we're making things up now in the name of love. 
If you don't know the purpose of something, all you can do is misuse it. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 says, This is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. John says the church, look, th this is not a new message. Jesus spoke this message. This is the message we've preached from the beginning, that we should love one another. And so what does that look like? And John goes into very much a lot of depth on what that looks like within the church. A depth is what that looks like as a people of God. What a depth of what that looks like within our life. You know, this past week, two weeks ago, I, I challenged the church. I said, hey, uh, the pastor at Union Hill just had a baby. If anyone wants to give diapers, let's give them some diapers. I, I don't, the just, I just kind of popped up. I was like, hey, here's a great opportunity. Let's put love into action, right? I mean, let's not just say good, well wishes. Let's actually do something. And so, so some of you did that, and it was great. And so here's what we, we saw uh, this past week. We got a picture of it. Okay, there it is. Look at all those diapers, right? 780 diapers to be specific that they got blessed with. Now, I haven't had a newborn for a while, but I think that will last at least a week. All right, so, <laughs> but, but, so I took these diapers and I, I called Pastor Mike and I said, Hey, Mike, I've, I've got a gift for you. Uh, we're doing this series at our church and we just wanted to bless you guys. And he's like, oh, okay, great. I said, yeah, we got some diapers. He's like, awesome. So, uh, you know, he wasn't there. And so I, uh, pa Pastor Powers, uh, you know, the worship pastor, I, I met him at the door and I said, hey, I got you. will you help me get this stuff in? We're loading. And he's like, what are you doing? I said, well, it's love illuminated. It's love in action. It's just like, we just wanted to do something, you know? And so he's like, oh, great, great, great. So he's like, let's just pile them on his desk. And so I was like, awesome. So he put this big mound on his desk and then we left. And then I got a text a few hours later. Are you serious? <laughs> Thank you so much. This is such a blessing. Very humbled that your church would do this for us. You know, it's just this idea that, that love in actions, loving others. And, and not just in word, but also in deed. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I quickly, I grew up in a family that, hey, love you. Like, love you was not something that we didn't hear in our family. Some of you grew up in families that I love you was very, very rare. I've got, got close friends that you know, they still struggle with, with the, when I say I love them. They're like, what, 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 is something ha did someone die? Like, why are you saying these words to me, you know? Because it's, it's uncomfortable for them. When I was a kid, like, if you left the room, you told everybody you loved them, right? Like, everyone gets a hug and a kiss, you know? It's like, hey, we'll see you guys later. We'll be back for lunch. You know, love you, love you, love you. And so that's the way I grew up. So love you, to me, is, is, is not unnatural. But, but for all, many, many people in our society today, and probably for some of you here, to say I love you, I mean, that, it's, it's hard to do. Because even those words are sometimes kind of hard to get out of our mouths. But, I mean, but definitely to put those words into action. I think it's something that sometimes we all struggle with. It's not just something that we say, but something that we show on a daily basis. 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 through 20. The Apostle John goes on to say, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? John says, how can we truly be loving if we can see someone in need, we have the answer for them, and yet we choose to do nothing? How, how can the love of God be in us? Dear children, he says, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth. I mean, how many times have I had conversations with people who said, I, I just want to know that I'm doing what God calls me to do. I just want to know that I'm being, being the believer that God has called me to believe. John says, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. That our, our words are followed by our actions. That when we separate those two, there, there's got to be a dissettling in our heart. John says, if you want to live at peace, if you want to be able to, to close your eyes and rest and say, God, I know, even though it's not perfect, even though I sometimes fall and I have to ask you for forgiveness, I know I'm striving to do what you've called me to do because my words line up with my actions. This is then how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts Condemn us. You know, that, that last phrasing I read over and over this week. Because I, I believe that, that oftentimes in the, in the quietness of our hearts, in the stillness of our lives, and typically because our lives are so busy, it, it's, it comes in the evening time. And in that evening quiet, 
as we lay down and we, we struggling to go to sleep, in that evening quiet as we're just kind of left with our own thoughts, how oftentimes the enemy tries to condemn us. How oftentimes our, our hearts begin to, to speak and, and we begin to question the love of the Father or we begin to question our love for others or we begin to question others' love for us. And, and how John says, look, if you want to set your hearts at ease, if you want to be at peace in those moments, then, then make sure that your, your words line up with your actions. Stand up, remind yourself of the truth of God's word. Remind yourself of how God loves you and he died for you. And don't allow our hearts to speak something differently into our minds. I believe that the purpose of true love is to bring peace. I believe when you seek Jesus, I mean, how else would you define Jesus as love? That while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Why? So that, that we could have a peace. A relationship restored with the Father and with us. That, that, that true love, when it comes into a situation, there's just a peacefulness that falls over the household. We, we've been in households that said that they love, but it was a very conditional love and there was anything but peace, right? But we've also hopefully had the experience of, of when true love entered into a relationship or true love entered into a family and all of a sudden that which was disruptive, there's a peace that's now there. doesn't mean that everything's perfect. But it means that there's a calm in the midst of the storm. That all of a sudden when we're loving in the way in which Jesus loved us, no matter what's going on on the outside of the boat, on the inside we have a peace in knowing that Christ is with us. And if he's with us, then there's this purity of love that's there. And how oftentimes we need that within our life. It breaks my heart when I see those who are wrestling with this sense of peace in their life. Who truly, who truly just, I mean, there's, there's this fear of what's outside of the boat and, and this, this reality that sometimes the waves can get so big. I mean, didn't Peter experience this firsthand, right? As he, he saw the waves and he sees Jesus walking and he says, Lord, if it's you, call me out. And Jesus says to come. And so he steps out and all of a sudden Peter's walking on the water. And it says, though, that as his eyes begin to drift off of the Savior and onto the, to the sea, I mean, how natural that would have been. There, there's an excitement that comes when we first hear the Savior's voice, but there's a reality that comes when the walk isn't as quick as we hoped it would be. When it takes some time to get by His side, and in the midst of that time, we begin to, to see the, the situations in life. We begin to see the financial realities within our life. We begin to see the reality that is life. We can easily get our eyes off of him. And when we do that, we begin to experience that sinking feeling. I believe that Peter must have felt. And I'm so thankful we serve a God who reaches down. And is able to bring us back up. And to remind us of a love that he has for us. That while we were yet sinners, that he died for us. That, that Savior that we talk about this morning. I, I want to focus on his words today because in, in Luke chapter 10, I believe he really breaks down this whole idea in a love that's very practical, very hands-on. That as he was teaching others about this type of love, as he was teaching others uh, about what that actually looked like in our lives, that he did it and described it in such a very specific way that no one walked away going, I wonder what he means by that, Right? I mean, they may have walked away saying, I don't believe in that. That, that was very much probably the case. But, but they, they didn't walk away going, I don't understand what he's talking about. Everyone walked away knowing whether they chose to believe it, whether they chose to follow it or not was their choice. But they walked away understanding. And we find it in Luke chapter 10. The middle of chapter 10. In Luke's gospel. Before Jesus dives into this parable, it says that, that on one occasion, an expert of the law, he stood and he tried to test Jesus. And he said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Remember the first week we talked about eternal life, this, this idea that it's not just linear. This timeline in which it will never end, but this also is this death, this life and life abundantly that Christ came to give. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' response was what is written in the law. And the man replied, he said, how do you read it? And the man replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. 
and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Then it says in verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? <laughs> we never want to go above and beyond what's required of us, do we? Right? Like, like the man answered correctly. He could have left it right there, right? So like he's answered Jesus. Jesus has responded, hey, that's the right answer. Do that and you'll live. He could have walked away going, hey, I did it. I mean, Jesus said, said I had it, right? But no, 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 he wants to clarify himself. Why? Because we never want to do more than what's required of us. We never want to go the extra mile, it would seem. We always want to do just enough to, to, to be saved, just enough to, to have this relationship, just enough to experience God in its fullness. But why would we do more than that, right? So we're always asking clarifying questions of Jesus. So this man's asking a clarifying question. Jesus resp responds with a parable. We pick up in verse 30 through 37. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and when he fell into the hands of robbers... They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. And a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. I want to stop right there because as Jesus is, is sharing this story, pro, most likely a parable that many of you have heard many, many times. And even if you haven't heard it, you've grown up with this idea, you've heard it in, in talk of we need to be good Samaritans, right? And whether you realize where that came from in Scripture or not, you realize and you quickly understood what it meant, that, that we need to do things for other people. We need to be kind to other people. Jesus is sharing the story and he talks about the priest and the Levite that as they, they saw the man in need that they crossed to the other side and that they walked on. All of the crowd would have known why they did that. Well, if we touch the man, then now, now you know, we're unclean and we're going to have to go through a cleaning process, a, a ceremonial process, and we've got a job to do. That we've got things to do for God and so we can't help others. Isn't it amazing how we can justify in our minds not doing what God has called us to do because we think we're doing a better thing for God? Another sermon, another day. But as Jesus is teaching, he, he says, and, but then there was this Samaritan, and, and I, I would have loved to have seen the crowd's reaction. Because the Samaritan would have had no business in this parable. He definitely would have been the one helping. I mean, you don't make the Samaritan the good guy in a story for Jewish people. But Jesus says, then there was a Samaritan. And as he traveled and came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. How many times just within the past week did you truly see someone who was in need? I mean, it, it takes us really looking because we see people all the time. But, but, but there's a difference between seeing them and truly seeing them, right? And it says that the Maritan, he, he, he saw the man and he took pity on him. So oftentimes we just act like we don't see the man. We act like we don't see our coworker. We act like, and I understand why, because, because, I mean, I don't want to get involved in the drama. I mean, you know so-and-so, it's always something, and I don't have time for the something. And so I'm just going to act like I don't see them crying. I'm just going to act like I don't see them hurting. I'm just going to act like everything's okay, and I'm just going to say like a you know, cordial, how's it going? And when they say fine, I'm just going to take them at their word, because I don't have time to really stop. I've got a lot of things going. I'm really busy today. I mean, I could list a lot of excuses that I've used myself. But the Samaritan, it says that he saw the man, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn and took care of him. 
what we see is that, that to truly love others the way that Christ has called us to love, to truly walk out and to say, you know what, I'm going to be that type of believer. I'm going to be the one who's known by my love. Then what's that look like? That means that love requires attention. That we have to be attentive to the people that God places in our path. I've often had people say to me, and I've even said it, I, I just want to be a part of a God thing. I want to do great things for the Lord. Don't miss the great things that may be the person in front of you looking to see the great things that God might have for you. The great thing may be the person. The great thing may be impacting a life that you were too busy to impact before, but you say, you know what? God's placed me here for a reason. What if it's for this person and we become that love in action for them? And it changes that person's history. It changes their family tree. I mean, we never know what the gospel is going to do for another person. We never know what an act of true love is going to do for one who's grown up with conditional love their whole life. We never understand what, what it's going to mean to someone when we truly love them the way that Jesus loved us when we were unworthy. And we love in that manner. Never demote that to, well, I guess that's small things for God. No, no, no. Those are large things for God. Because he cares for others. He cares for us. And he uses you and he uses me as his hands and his feet. Sometimes I, I get convicted of the, the moments that I've considered small. Because I've been chasing bigger things I thought for God. And so I didn't have time for the small things. But what if that was the big thing that God wanted to use me in? God, forgive me for the moments that I've crossed out on the other side of the road and not been attentive to the people that you've placed in my path. Now, I can't help but say that as a pastor and say, there's been times in my life, if I'm just going to be honest, there's been times in my life where I've looked at the church and I've overlooked my kids. You've had a lot of great pastors in your life as a church. But my kids are going to have one dad. And that's the one that's in front of me. Many parents, if I could just speak one thing to you, it's that you, your, your employees are going to have a lot of employers. Your, your customers are going to have a, a lot of people who give to them, but your kids are only going to have one mother and one father. Don't overlook them for great things that you want to accomplish for them. The great thing may just be loving them in the manner in which Christ loved us. Love requires attention. Scripture goes on to say, That he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. It requires attention, but, but love also requires affection. So easy to see someone in their need and in their state and say, you know what, I... <laughs> I know that there's probably places those people can go. I know there's some resources that they maybe can get. I know that, that there's people who can help them and, and we can give attention to it, but, but it doesn't break our hearts. You know, we talked last series about the things that break our hearts for God and, and how Nehemiah's heart was broken for the people of, of Israel that, that as their walls, the Jer Jerusalem walls were, were torn down, that his heart was broken. That, that he gave attention to it, but it, he also gave affection to it. That, that it was something broke his heart and he had to move. He had to do something about it. That sometimes that affection is that, that hands-on, you know, I'm going to walk with you during this time. I'm going to be with you during this time. You say, well, doesn't that take time? Yeah, it, it does take time. Is it going to disrupt your day? I guarantee you it will disrupt your day. Sometimes I think our days need disrupting so that God can show us why we're truly here. We're to build His kingdom, not our own. Love requires our attention. It requires our affection. 
but I believe it also requires action. It says in verse 35, The next day he took out two silver coins and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any expense you may have. (laughs) You know, I read this verse my whole life and it wasn't until this past year that I realized that the Samaritan had done something that I often fail to do. That the Samaritan had an attitude about helping that that oftentimes I've not had in my manner of helping others. And that attitude was this. If it's important to me, it should be important to everybody. Ever had that attitude? Right? If this is a powerful thing for me, then it should be a powerful thing for everybody. But guess what? It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes God gives you a heart, He gives you a passion, and, and, and He doesn't give it to everybody. He gives it to you. And He'll take other people. I've got a friend, a dear friend, who's, he, I mean, he just loves Nepal. He's been there 30 times. Our church has partnered with him at Life Fruit Church in, in Bethalto, Illinois. Our church partnered with him. And, and he had this passion for the people of Nepal. And as God grew that ministry, he had a passion to help them with, a, with an orphanage and then with a, a DTS training school. And, and then the earthquake came and leveled everything. And now they've already raised $75,000 to build it back up. I mean, if you wanted to get this man excited, just ask him, hey, what God's doing in Nepal? Be ready for like three hours of conversation because he's excited about Nepal. You know what, though? I've met other people who aren't excited about Nepal, but they're excited about Guatemala. I've met people since I've been here, they're excited about Rock Creek in this community. God, I believe, has a way of uniquely gifting and filling us with passion for certain areas and for certain responsibilities throughout this land. And just because he gives it to you and he doesn't give it to the other person doesn't mean that you're wrong and that they're right or that they're right and you're wrong. It just means that God's shown you a need. And he's asking you to fill the need. I I love what the Samaritan does. He says, I will reimburse you. He doesn't say, hey, I found this guy on the side of the road. I helped him out. I gave all my oil. I put him on my donkey. I brought him to the inn. Now it's your turn. You have the resources to provide him lodging for free. You have the resources to take care of him while I'm gone. You have the resources and the man says, what are you talking about? No, he doesn't do that. He says, I will reimburse you. I mean, we don't know the rest of the parable. Maybe he comes back. The guy says, God got a hold of me too. I'm excited to be a part of this ministry. We don't know. But he didn't serve with the expectation that God was bringing other people on board. He just knew what God had called him to do. He says, Lord, if no one else joins me, I know what you've called me to do. Church, there's going to be things that God presses on your heart and you're going to have a kindred spirit with some people and then some people are going to look at you with a blank stare going, why are you so passionate about that? It doesn't matter. Just do what God has called you to do. Love in the way in which God has called you to love. Give attention, give affection. But don't let your actions be dependent upon the enthusiasm of others. If God's called you to it, walk in that road. I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Jesus concludes it with this question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law, the one who had originally asked the question, replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. See, the apostle John wrote these words of Jesus, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus says, look, there's going to be one defining fact between my disciples and all the other disciples that this earth encounters. There's going to be one defining fact that then when people see it, they're going to say, that's a disciple of Jesus. There's going to be one defining action that when, when people encounter it in their daily lives, they're going to say, I know where those people are from. I know who their teacher is. I know who their Messiah is. It's got to be Jesus because they love in the same manner in which he loved. If you love one another. 
You know, Mother Teresa said this, if we really want to love, we must learn to forgive before anything else. If we really want to experience love and we really want to be the disciples that God has called us to be and love others, then we must learn to forgive and not just forgive others. But some of us, we need to wrestle with that. And not just say that we forgive and, and nod politely when we see. No, 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 no. Truly forgive. The way in which Christ forgave us. I'm so glad Christ doesn't forgive me the way that I've in my life forgiven others. Because the reality would be he hadn't forgiven them. He just acted like everything was okay. When Christ forgives, he truly forgives. And he calls us to forgive others in the same manner. You say, well, I don't know how to do that. I, I can't experience that. Well, sometimes we just need to learn how, how to forgive ourselves. Because the reality is that when we ask Christ forgiveness, He's forgiven us, but sometimes we live under in the same prison that we were in before. Oh, the door's wide open now, but we refuse to walk out because we can't forgive ourselves for the things that we've done, for the relationships that we've destroyed for the actions that we haven't done or for the actions that we have done and we find ourselves still in the same prison. It seems like we're not experiencing life and life abundantly. It's not because Christ hasn't forgiven. It's because we haven't forgiven ourselves. I don't believe the enemy cares. Just stay in the prison. If I can convince them that they're not forgiven, then that's great. Church, sometimes we just need to stand on the truth of God's word, whether we feel it or not. Do you know you can't live life by your feelings? Because they're all over the board. We have to live life by the truth. God says, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. He's called me to a path, I'm walking that path. He says, I'm made righteous by what he's done, not by what I've done. That's the truth of God's word. 1 John 3, John wraps it up and he says, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. And the question I have for you this morning, the, the question I, I want to throw out to you today, and I, I, just, I thought, you know, what if we had some homework today? Everyone loves homework, right? If you want to get serious about this, this isn't homework for you to do with everybody. This is with just you and a specific partner. You get to choose your partner, right? It's one of those type of homework assignments. But to get to some, with someone that you trust, to get to with someone that, that you, you feel that they'll be honest with you, but also loving, you know, share the truth in love. We often forget that in love part, don't we? Oh, we're ready to share the truth. You, oh, you let me share the truth. But no, 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 in love, right? Sometimes, sometimes you just want to back people up and say, whoa, 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 whoa. in love. Don't forget in love, right? And, but we're, we're ready to share the truth, but in love. Get with that person. And then ask them this question. Is my love for others evident? I mean, I can convince myself of anything. Just give me enough time. But I want to ask someone who, who's on the other side, is, is my love for others evident? Not because I'm seeking your approval, but, but because I just want to make sure that my actions are, are in line with my words. People say, well, I, I can't do this for everybody. Do it who you, for who you can you know, Peter and John, when they were entering the, the temple gates, there was a, a beggar there, and he was asking for money. And they said, well, silver and gold do we do not have. They could have stopped. <laughs> you want silver? You want gold? We don't have any. Sorry. And they keep walking, right? <laughs> no, no, no. But what we have, we give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, take up your mat and walk. That guy didn't realize he was getting that today. Sometimes we'll excuse our lack of love for others because we don't have resources. Church, you have Jesus Christ. What greater resources do you have? If we, if we don't have something, we can't give something. But we, but we all, as a believer in Christ, have Jesus. We can give Jesus. We can walk with people in the name of Jesus. We can love in the name of Jesus. 
is that my love for others evident. Mother Teresa also said, if you can't feed 100 people, feed one. <laughs> do what you can do. Love where God has placed you. Don't be waiting for the big thing down the road. As you leave today, be looking with attentive eyes. Be looking with an affectionate heart. And be looking with a spirit of action and saying, God, as you place people in my path, I'm going to be your light to them. And I'm going to love them the way in which you love me. Whether they deserved it or not. Whether the society would say that they, they deserved it, Lord God, I didn't deserve it, but yet you loved. So I want to be those type of people to love others in the way in which you've loved me. God, if we could just put those words into action, what a difference it would make. Won't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. God, I thank you because I know that so many here today. Lord, their lives are characterized by this action. Lord, that they truly put their action alongside of their words. Lord, they're loving not only in word, but, but in deed. But God, I pray that you would show all of us in deeper ways how we can love others in the way in which you loved us. God, I pray that you would speak specifically to our hearts this week as we go throughout our day, as we go throughout our week. Lord, that we would be attentive to the people that you place in our path. Lord, that we would not look over them for something larger. God, that we would not excuse our call as believers because we believe we have something more important to do. But God, that we would realize... That every day that you give us is a gift. God, that we would realize that the people you place in our path, Lord, God, that we have the chance to Im impact them with the good news, with the love of Jesus Christ. Lord, whether that's our kids, whether that's our spouse, whether that's our friends, God, whether that's the stranger that we meet today. Lord, when we leave their presence, that they would realize there was something different with that encounter. And that we could show them that that difference is always you. Father, we love you. We praise you. Help us to be men and women of action when it comes to this word love. And we'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, won't you stand this morning? I want to invite you. These altars are open if you'd like to come and pray. Maybe as you're preparing to leave, maybe our prayer today is simply, God, give me eyes to see so easy for me to put blinders on and go throughout my day. But God, help me to be attentive to those that you've placed in my path and to love them in the way in which you love me. God, I need your spirit to see others in that way. Would you give me that eyesight? Let's sing. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night as you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, and I've seen many searching for answers, far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide we call just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are 
It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Love so undeniable I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to invite you back this evening. We're going to have a, a roundtable discussion. And if you didn't get a chance to join with us last time, this will be a great chance for you to come. You can ask some questions. We're also just going to be sharing a little bit about the church, about 2016, what that's going to look like, and, and really spending some time also in prayer, just asking God to give us direction, give us wisdom, give us clarity, and to help us to see those that He's placed already within our path. And then next week, don't turn to your neighbor and say, don't let me miss next week. All right. All right. <clears throat> don't miss next week. We're going to have a great time of a service together. We're going to be hearing from the youth and, and we're going to be you know, singing with them and, and hearing from them all of the things which God is doing. It really does tell uh, very nicely with this series of Love Illuminated because their whole theme was on... Love, that's right, exactly. And so, so we're going to come and, and hear, uh, don't miss that, it's going to be a great time. Come and encourage them and uh, be a part of what we're uh, talking about today. And, and you know, it's, it's so neat, to, always convicting for me. Because when you hear the way in which God is speaking and moving in the hearts and lives of young people, that there's often a challenge there. And, and that we would walk away challenged next week. We would walk away excited next week. We would walk away saying, you know what? God is doing great things. I'm so thankful he's, he's allowed me to be a part of that in which he's doing. So come out next week and support our youth and just join in a time of worship. Bring a friend. You know, just say, you got to come see our youth group. They're awesome. You got to come hear them. And uh, bring a friend, and I promise you won't be disappointed. I want to close this this morning in a word of prayer. There's, there's announcements in your bulletin. Uh, be sure and, and catch those. And... Um, Let's close this morning, though, in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I, we sing about how good you are. God, I, we just can't even imagine. We can't even comprehend. Lord, what those words truly mean, because you are far greater than anything we could imagine. God, you love us deeper than anything we've ever experienced. God, Lord, that you would show us more and more of that each and every day. Lord, for those here today that they're struggling to believe that. Lord, they're struggling to believe that a father that good would love them for all that they've done. God, I pray that you would speak truth to them today. And to show them that you love them. That you died for them. Lord, that as we have all sinned and fallen short of your glory, God, if we will confess our sins. 
and call upon you as Lord and as Savior. That we can be saved. That we can have a relationship with you. God, as we leave this place, let that love that you've shown us, God, I, I just pray that it would just flow through us. God, in ways in which we didn't even expect, God, that, that as you place people in our lives, Lord, at the checkout counter and, Lord, at work, God, that, that all of a sudden you just begin to give us the words. That, that when we leave those conversations, when we leave those moments, we would just realize, man, God, was, you were at work there. Thank you for giving us that opportunity. Lord, that you would use your hands and your feet. God, that you would use us to impact this community, to impact this world in a way in which it's yet to see. And so when it's all said and done, Father, all glory and honor and praise would go to you and you alone. Lord, thank you for what you're doing. God, we're excited for what you have in store. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.